Dreyfors has worked on yeah, um, a couple organizations. If you guys are interested in numbers, don't stay in this room. Yeah, I'm going to try to avoid that. Uh, yeah, uh, we're going to try to keep it a little bit simpler. Um, a little bit more about uh, the strategy. Uh, we're going to try to avoid a lot of numbers. Who's, uh, who's a newlywed to five years? Anybody new? Okay, I got one. Uh, I'll try to keep my uh, remarks with regards to my experiences doing body as well. Sometimes I spit and uh, cuss at the blood working in the environmental field. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so, there's a lot of challenges associated with it. We've been uh, going at it for quite a while. Um, I think we were really psyched about biodiesel when we first started out. And the whole idea of getting away from the, the grid and uh, uh, fossil fuel connections. And we, uh, we kind of soon realized this, this is a tough battle. Um, I had spent about 20 years or so working in handicraft development in developing countries. So, um, very challenging. Uh, to get U.S. consumers to consume products from some of the most biologically diverse places on the planet, beautiful places, and products that were made by women in indigenous communities. Absolutely gorgeous products, lots of natural fiber materials, um, and brought them to market, brought them to trade shows, and the response uh, from the consumer, um, very, very hard to get the, the willingness to pay to get people to actually uh, consume this stuff and help support uh, what they call ICDPM. Um, integrated conservation and development programs, and uh, uh, you know, trying to work with conservation groups in the buffer zones and protected areas of some of the last great places on the planet. Very, very challenging to get to understand the uh, idea of generation of income for local communities. So, been um, been very interested in you know from from my career, been very interested in that, that idea of market externalities, and and if you look at biodiesel energy consumption. We, uh, we have some serious problems, and what I'm trying to, what I wanted to do with, for you all was to try to, you know, this conference is about collective biodiesel. Great collective concepts are really, really important. I have, we have, I have to a couple of organizations, a couple of groups, one of which is a nonprofit, and uh, a couple of LLCs, limited liability companies. But we also manage the Bull City Biodiesel Cooperative, which has been a little bit of a challenge trying to get people to come together and, and work. So the cooperative model is, is really one of those things that um, takes a lot of work, a, a lot of time, a lot of resources. So when we look at strategies going forward, you know, what do we spend our time doing? Um, what do we, you know, what, in these waning moments of the planet, these last great uh, you know, gasp here, um, what do we spend our time trying to do? So what I wanted to get to you all was the idea that we you know, can sit here and work the minutia of all these opportunities to be green, to reduce our carbon footprint, to work within the, the limitations that the planet offers us. But boy, we were running out of time. So I know you guys probably are very interested in a lot of the nuts and bolts of how to do biodiesel. But what I wanted to show was the idea of value adding that fuel into a business that actually can generate revenue, but also kind of change the flavor a little bit. Um, that. Greenway Transit, which is the business that I'm going to talk about, is a company that value adds the fuel and runs people around in buses. So it's um, it's actually a really rewarding, though absolutely challenging business. Anybody go on the trip yesterday? Yes. So I was going to start out really optimistically that Greenway, you know, you can make lots of money. It's really easy to do, no problem. But we broke down yesterday. <laughs> so. We had uh, our bus coming back from the Catawba Center and, and blew a hose. And the situation with um, transportation with buses, um, lots of variables and lots of challenges. Um, but what's quite interesting is that the same energy that you put into, say, biodiesel and getting and tweaking all of those variables, and particularly the size stream incomes, and trying to get biodiesel to the point where it, it um, makes sense economically, it's just in uh, uh, Jeremy's talk, and he, uh, he showed the, uh, the RENs, the 50% greenhouse gas emissions, and essentially none of the uh, agricultural products actually fit the, uh, the uh, RENs credits if you add the greenhouse gases emitted during the production of agricultural products. So the only thing that actually made any sense from a biodiesel standpoint is the uh, collection of used cooking oil, <laughs> which I'm like, oh my god. 
you know, there's not enough growing, uh, cooking oil out there to make a difference, so we know that. Um, but when you, you know, look at the transportation and the, the idea of value adding the fuel, the limited amount of fuel that we can make right now, say, with the lowest footprint, the lowest greenhouse gases, where it needs to go is where. What's the best place that we can put biodiesel? What, anybody? What's the, the biggest bang for the buck that we can possibly put biodiesel? What kind of vehicle can we put in it? Oh, true. Uh, the 18 wheel uh, promoted. Uh, All right. What about emissions from an emission standpoint? What's the best place we can put it? School bus. School bus. School buses. Right now, kids are going to school in the morning and coming home from the afternoon and spending anywhere from 15 minutes to a couple hours riding on a school bus. And those buses are so poorly designed that if you took air emissions uh, analysis inside the bus, they would be getting hit with like maximum levels across the board, a whole range of um, emissions that are considered carcinogenic and uh, not good for your health. So we wonder why our kids don't do so well in school, have bad test scores. There's a number of uh, organizations out there right now. Um, one that I know that's most active is the group in uh, Bronx that is going after the school system to put biodiesel in school buses. But I think there's several across the, the country, and you know, there's idle reduction uh, programs. But really, the biggest bang for buck for the limited amount of biodiesel that we have out there right now is to put it in school buses. Not only can we you know, uh, make them greener, um, we can take an old school bus that's a, uh, a hog um, that you know, just blows out nasty emissions and clean it up. But we can also help in air emissions and protection of our kids. And in that age group of children riding on school buses, that is one of the most uh, you know, sensitive to air emissions uh, units within our, our, our society. So there is a bang for buck. What's the challenge to getting more supplies in the school buses? <laughs> Biggest challenge, we don't have enough right to production there. What's that? To break the contract. That yeah, oh know. yeah, right. well, that's one of the, yeah, and the, the issue of cost, absolutely. One of the, the biggest challenges I've come across is the fleet managers, just getting them to even talk to you. Um, and so, anyway, I just want to go through a little bit of the history of um, how I got to where I am right now. Um, pull up more things. So I'm getting going late here, but um, okay, so here is our site. Um, this is where we're located. So one of the, the things that's really, really important is So you know where we're down here in Pittsburgh, right? So Durham, Triangle, Raleigh, Chapel Hill, three universities, center of North Carolina between the mountains and the sea. So we're situated right here on 85 and I-40, really excellent you know, from a distribution standpoint. If you're looking at production of fuel and the distribution and the logistics collection of oil, it's a great spot, you can't beat it. Um, there's a lot of places like this across the United States, uh, strategically, you know, location of small bodies of plants within a certain feed stock. But what's unique about our site is its location in East Durham. I'm going to drill down here. So we're coming down. This is a Durham uh, freeway. Uh, 85 is just above. This section of East Durham, right along the railroad tracks, this is where um, our Amtrak comes through. And uh, this is downtown Durham over here. And that bit. Google is such a pain, like this new map um, system, and it's not nearly as effective, I think it's an old one. Downtown Durham, um, this street right here, Fayetteville, is kind of the divider between the one side of the tracks and the other side of the tracks. So, me working in the environmental field for quite a while, I've got an undergrad degree in environmental science, uh, chemistry uh, from UNC Wilmington, I went to Duke for a master's, did my master's on natural gas, looking at the natural gas industry in North Carolina and the potential for production and exploration production uh, off the coast in the outer continental shelf, and looking at where pipelines and onshore facilities would go. So I looked at the oil and gas industry very closely, went down to Louisiana, looked at uh, the infrastructure there. Interestingly, we're kind of sitting in one of the uh, new hotbeds for potential gas production, the Triassic Basin, which spreads east here over to Raleigh. A lot of interest in natural gas um, fracking. So I've been um, interested in you know, these issues of 
Yeah. Okay. Uh, controversy. Um, I, when I got out of graduate school, I, I became really fascinated with the loss of biodiversity. The idea of ecotourism, bringing people to last great places, the idea of value adding handicrafts to sell to people who visit those places, and then taking those handicrafts and bringing them into the international market. Some of these handicrafts are just amazing. They're not just handicrafts, but they're really high quality products that have a lot of, a lot of utility and a lot of fashion. We worked in places like Madagascar, last you know, the, the, the jewels of the planet, it's spectacular biodiversity, and it is trash. 95% of the, the forest has been cut. So the last little pieces, the remnant, the, the, uh, the parks that are left that are being actively uh, addressed, uh, integrated to conservation and development. The, the uh, conservation communities are in there, the communities trying to find ways for them to generate income. So to, you know, flipping this around, we got out of candy crafts when we realized how the globalized markets were getting so challenging. The suppression of Yuan by the Chinese made everything made in the world look expensive except what was coming out of China. Literally, the Chinese were taking raw raffia from Madagascar, bringing it to China, and manufacturing a whole range of products, and then introducing them to the U.S. market, cheaper than we could directly import them from Madagascar. Um, the energy associated with that, the movement of things around the planet, how things work. And what we found is that because there's no price on the externality of fossil fuels and energy, we're the price of everything is wrong. So that's the big challenge for all of us who are trying to make a living doing this stuff. The other one is that, my God, we're running out of time. We don't have time to sit here and work the minutiae of how we can become more sustainable. There, we know we can do it. The, the work of you all, the work of so many organizations out there showing how we can change and make this thing happen, get to a green economy, move forward. So my interest in the environmental movement is always about these kind of edge things, these things like the externalities, uh, market externalities. So I moved from international uh, handicrafts. Uh, I think I was at a fair, I'm not sure what it was, maybe it was the Earth Day Festival here in, in uh, the area, and saw Piedmont out there with their little jars of biodiesel, and they had their, uh, their cooperative down in Moncure. And I'm going, wow, waste to fuel. That sounds like a winner there. Um, you know, waste is free maybe, or you can get paid to collect the oil, um, and then you can convert it into fuel. Awesome, that's a great idea. But then you go out and collect the oil, and today it's not so free, hard to get it free, most likely paying for it, and certainly paying for this collection. So we became, uh, we actually built a plant um, here in East Durham. Um, using Piedmont's help, we uh, actually built a plant right in East Durham. And the reason why we moved to East Terms goes back to this idea of um, working the edge here. So um, this is all at the industrial corridor right here. And our plant, just to the east, uh, old oil terminal, uh, explosion proof pumps, 500,000 gallons of, of, of storage capacity up on the hill, and uh, we put in one of the bays, or garage bays, right there um, on the uh, right hand building. Buildings built you know, to handle an explosion, a large scale explosion, I mean they're, they're concrete and brick, like uh, three feet wide. Um, amazing building, and incredible infrastructure, containment on the whole property, oil water separator system. Uh, actual terminal for distribution where they had six grades of fuel that you could distribute. So we actually you know, got the 100,000 gallon plant going. It took us a while, it took about eight months or so. Um, we produced about 10,000 gallons and then ran out of money. So um, we couldn't get a grant, we couldn't get, we went to the biofuel center in North Carolina, we went to the banks, we went to the conservation fund. We had some small investors um, and so we built this plant and then kind of didn't go anywhere. 
we distributed about 120,000 gallons of fuel using uh, tanker trucks, the short truck, and a large uh, <coughs> trailer. We brought tanker trailers in from Piedmont, from other uh, distributors of fuel. Um, uh, we did foothills in Lenoir, Lenoir um, up in the mountains. So we'd buy fuel and then redistribute it. We'd drop it off onto a big tanker truck and then uh, put it into our short truck and go out and distribute to uh, a bunch of wholesale customers where we had put in small 500 or 1,000 gallon tanks. We had a couple of recycling companies, a moving company, a couple of green builders, all really interested in running biodiesel. So um, we had some challenges. I mean, it was a real, um, a lot of work going into the distribution of that fuel and the margins were very thin. What we found with all of our clients was that um, as much as they love bodies and the idea of going green, they don't want to pay anything for it. They're like, why is your fuel more expensive than diesel? So this, you know, immediately went, hold on, you know, hold up, look at all the great things that are coming, the multiplier effect, the, the economics associated with doing this. The fact that we're in the East Durham, uh, creating jobs, all of these things, well, eh, eh, not so much, not, didn't really care too much about that. They wanted their fuel at or about the diesel price. So we were able to get the fuel below diesel, and then you add all the costs of the infrastructure, the building of our plant. Um, we probably took about $100,000 to build the plant. So we used our cash flow coming off of that, um, that distribution stream of income to help build this plant. But it, it just wasn't enough to actually kind of get us through, particularly the downturn in 2008. We had the methanol prices go through the ceiling with the explosion of the plant down in the Caribbean. And so the feedstocks became more expensive and then uh, we just kind of ran out of cash. And we had been busting it for about two and a half years uh, doing the distribution and building out our plant. We just said, you know, this is really, really hard. Um, we shuttered our plant. We pulled everything apart and moved next door uh, to another old petroleum plant, right, where you see all these uh, what look like sticks, but those are buses, those are the tops of our buses um, sitting in the, that yard. So we just mothballed everything. We pulled uh, the cavitator reactor that uh, Piedmont had built for us, really cool piece of equipment, made great fuel, um, pretty cost effectively, um, sitting in the warehouse, just collecting dust. And I can say just emphatically that I'm so glad that I'm not making fuel anymore. There were so many variables. Um, the methanol recovery, we still hadn't quite cracked that nut, and that was an important side stream income, um, important component. Um, the glycerol, you know, what do we do with all the glycerol left? Um, we tried to work with the local um, sewer and water plant to be able to give them glycerol, uh, dirty raw glycerol, to help them in the production of, uh, in, in improvement of the bacteria to break down the sewer. Uh, great idea, you know, they're buying uh, pharmaceutical grade glycerin uh, from a company and paying an unbelievable amount. And we're like, and we can give it to you for like a quarter of that price and still make money on the glycerol, but they just weren't interested. Really, really challenging. So anyway, we shifted gears. We shifted gears literally and figuratively. We went into a business we had just started getting going uh, when we built our plant. We had um, been working with a guy locally who had a cute little Mercedes bus. We had been getting calls. You know, we're sitting here doing you know, the biodiesel and selling fuel, trying to get more uh, customers. We were getting calls continuously from people saying, do you know any transportation company that wants to run biodiesel or is, is, is running biodiesel? And like, oh, well, hold on, you know, put them on hold. Call the local livery companies, the local transportation of Carolina Livery, uh, Southern Coach, uh, Horizon, uh, a bunch of real big companies and a couple of smaller ones. We asked them, would you be interested in putting a tank, 500 gallon tank, and running one of your vehicles on biodiesel, B20, B50, anything? And they're all hell no. And then you know we call them again, and like definitely, definitely not. Um, so we're like, okay, we got this opportunity to work um, with another gu a guy with a, a bus and run 100% biodiesel. This little cute little Mercedes, uh, this bio bus, and we'll show it to you in a second. Uh, so uh, we started out doing that, and we started getting that thing started taking off, and then we got an opportunity to buy an old MCI, Motor Coach Industries, uh, uh, 47 passenger stick shift hmm. Crusader 9. Oh my God! You know, I've been driving our tanker truck, um, 2800 gallon tanker truck, about 
28,000 pounds or so. This thing was big and it was heavy and it was loaded with luggage and people. The old, uh, you know, you're on a hill, try to get in first, emergency brake on. Okay, don't stall, don't stall. All the passengers will laugh. Um, that was the pressure on you to learn how to make that stick work. Um, so it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. It was my learning curve for sure. Um, I think I still got a bad knee from that clutch. Um, I mean, I, my ligaments like messed up. Uh, but eventually, we uh, we advanced to some more sophisticated equipment, a little newer. Uh, that thing had some oil gushers in the back on the engine. That you know, I was going. I think my footprint's pretty big here. Um, I'm not sure we would have made it like in places like New Jersey, like the um, the where they have the, um, the casinos. The Department of Transportation and Federal uh, Highway Patrol set up little places to um, to check buses, and if you leak too much oil, they'll pull that bus off. That's one of the rules and regulations. So I knew that bus wasn't going to make it to New Jersey, to the to the, um, to the, uh, the gambling casinos. Um, so we got rid of that thing, we scrapped it, took it down, literally down the street um, and scrapped it um, and scrapped it. I got some money out of it, we pulled a bunch of the equipment off of it um, and uh, have been using it um, to, you know, when something goes down on our, our newer buses, um, luckily some of the stuff is interchangeable. So um, we have been going at the transportation business now for about six years since we, um, we started it uh, in the other site. And it is really doing well. We're up to about three hundred thousand dollars or so annual gross. We're probably netting about fifty. We bought all this equipment on cash flow. We used um, a slow money type of loan lending system. Um, Carol's going to be talking, or did you already talk about tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning about the whole idea of uh, how do you capitalize these projects and the uh, importance of this idea of peer to peer lending and uh, community based uh, capital systems really, really interesting, intriguing, and important component of uh, resiliency development. I mean, we lose capital out of our communities by energy, food, and, and the, the lending of money. You know, lending, we use banks, big banks, money goes into their system and it's spinning around the world. Um, energy, you know, we go to the pump, the money goes into the hands of some big corporation, uh, and then food. So if you see, if you see the the hope of the future. Um, it's things like what Carol's doing and uh, micro lending and the community based lending systems, these new like cooperative banks systems, getting the money out of the big banks. It's the local foods movement where like this area is absolutely nuts with local foods. And then it's the um, area of distributed energy production, which you know by this represents one of many. So you know we are working on the edge here um, in what uh, is what will be extremely important going forward. So why East Durham? Why are we in the hood? This is a tough neighborhood. Actually, our site is called the Goal Site. Green oil and light. Um, green oil, because right next door of the old petroleum site, ExxonMobil, was owned by Greens, family, Green family. The uh, light part was you know, kind of the power and light company. But it's also where our, our site is. It's the old red light district for Durham. We actually had a house of ill repute on our property, and I think the fire department uh, burned it down about 30 years ago as a demonstration of how he put out a fire. So uh, it's pretty amazing. So in, in tribute to our heritage, um, we have in included that concept in our, 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 uh, our name. The, uh, this building right here it is uh, it's the old um, ice house for the city of Durham. Our property actually is where the old coal terminal uh, was uh, off the rail line. You bring coal cars in, dump them into dollies, and send it to go out throughout the, uh, the community. Um, there was also an old lumber yard, massive lumber yard, that was here even before the oil terminal. But while we're in East Durham, um, you know, it gets back to this idea, okay, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to spend our time in these last moments here of trying to make a difference? And to me, building movement, building activism. And if you think of our professional careers, um, this is something I, I get uh, kind of uh, have an issue with. Uh, I graduated from Duke, you know, one of these Ivory Tower institutions, and I get occasionally invited back to speak there, and um, I think they you know, see me and usually put the cross up. Um, but you know, we what we learn in school, you know, the theory. 
and how we approach our careers, it seems like we're so driven by success and you know, what we are able to achieve. And I'm going, you know, we need to dial back from all of that. We need to be spending more time in community and in action and in activism. And we need to build a coalition to, around these issues, finding common cause from right to left on the political spectrum. And I tell you what, the bus and the bus business does it. It is absolutely amazing. Because we are taking people on buses to go protest all, all forms of folks. We have an opportunity to educate. We have a mobile classroom on these buses. We have a mobile billboard on the side of the buses. And I tell you what, when people get on the bus and you do your little spiel about the fact that we're running the bus on biodiesel, 50% reduction in air emissions, very low carbon footprint when you're making it from waste veggie oil, and people go, yay, they don't get you get to drive them around the block at least one more time until they do. Um, so that door stays closed. Uh, so we are trying to build movement. Um, and we think that at this point, it's, it's absolutely critical. So the cool thing about buses is that we have a huge client base, uh, very diverse. Um, but we're also working in East Durham. And the other day, we just uh, drove for the NAACP one of the oldest uh, organizations uh, devoted to civil rights. The civil rights movement in this country is one of the premier events um, in the world to uh, find equality and to change and transform our society. Apartheid movement, uh, the anti-apartheid uh, divestment in South Africa, another great seminal event in um, human history in developing equality. Well, we're at this other junction right now where if we don't get our act together with regards to sustainability, we are hosed. So we have to get out there and we have to fight the fight. And at this point, I think it's going to be blood. And, you know, our tagline for our company, Greenway, is a revolution in motion. So we, you know, we don't take, you know, we, I was just in an argument uh, in the last day or so with one of our customers, of our big customers, Fuqua Business School, the MBA program. You know, we got two really good ones here. Uh, Keenan Flagler and Fuqua Business. And those guys are being trained in sustainability, but it's kind of a little mamby-pamby, um, they call the triple bottom line. So anyway, the, the girl who hired us, this is the Net Impact Club, and every uh, business school has a Net Impact uh, Club, and they're about social entrepreneurship, which is kind of what you guys are doing. Um, and you know they're doing a tour this weekend of the new first years of all the really cool organizations in Durham. There's Trosa that works with ex offenders, uh, chemically dependent folks, and it trains them. They actually have a CDL program uh, training them in how to drive trucks. It's pretty cool. We've been trying to work with them. We actually, have, you know, we're like, man, you want to go with, with us on this biodiesel thing? You guys, they have a moving company too, and they have 20 trucks. They're a powerhouse. Um, they don't pay their people anything though. I think controversial. Um, you know, they've got free employment, but they're actually getting all these services from Trosa um, and benefit. But uh, anyway, we uh, were, I was negotiating with this girl from Fuqua, and she's you know, one of these hardcore MBAs. You know, you know, I want best deal on this thing. I'm going best deal, huh? Okay, well, we'll give you a deal. Very hard to get people to pay more for our transportation services. I mean, we've we have to go toe to toe with the guys that aren't green. Um, we have to be able to be com compete with them. Um, but we usually get the business over the guys that are um, are green. We, we usually get at least our foot in the door, and we've had a whole range of customers that have, uh, have at least checked us out. They may not hire us again, uh, given the message that we often give them. Uh, we don't really uh, hold back. We don't pull punches. Uh, we are pretty um, much. Uh, driven by the mission of what we're trying to do. We are less about buses than about the broader mission of issues and the vision of what we're trying to do. So anyway, building coalition requires us to not only be able to say, you know, talk to folks that don't necessarily understand, I'd say maybe 20 or 30 percent of our customers don't care that we're green. The rest really do and won't pay anything more for it, but um, a few of our nonprofits that hire us would like to pay us more than any money. Um, they think they believe in what we do. So building coalition is really what we're trying to do. And this is what's so kind of cool about the whole concept of what we're up to. Plus, this is what I've been using to help educate. I do my little elevator speech when people get on the bus. So 
Now this is kind of, you've probably seen something similar. Exactly with this, you guys can see it. Um, so, from aspect of building coalition. So we need to build coalition uh, across the board to change and transform our society. And what's so amazing about the buses um, is that it has a history. The bus is almost central to American history um, and societal transformation. You know, the automobile the development of the combustion engine, turn of the century, but not very far after that, buses were um, designed and developed in the United States to move people around. And you should see some of the pictures of these old buses. They are so cool. They're classics. Um, you know, started out pretty small, but if you look at the uh, development of social mobility in the United States, um, the movement of people around, the wanderlust. You know, I want to, as a middle class or low income person, go see America. Well, you know, they didn't jump on a jet, they jumped on a bus. And they spent a lot of time sitting on that bus bumping over two lane roads. And then we had a highway system. But buses have been around as long as transportation. And um, if you look at the history of uh, the civil rights movement in this country, you have the Freedom Riders that rode around the South uh, trying to show uh, that people can live in coalition and, uh, together from diverse races and backgrounds. Um, you had Rosa Parks do the sit-in um, on a bus and, and the whole segregation, the focus on transportation and trying to um, uh, integrate uh, the transportation system. You had the March on Washington and uh, Martin Luther King's very seminal moment in the civil rights movement. A guy named Bayard Rustin was the one who um, choreographed the several thousand buses that brought all of these people to the United States, or brought people to Washington, D.C. And that must have just been amazingly challenging because they didn't have cell phones back then, or internet, or texting. I mean, he had to do this by like mail and phone, and, um, and it was a, an amazing choreography. Um, so the bus is still a, a vital component of transportation. If we look at equity issues associated with, say, increasing prices on energy, if we put a carbon tax on our society, and it is so uh, regressive from a, a socioeconomic standpoint. You are taxing the low income people when you increase energy prices. Because low income folks use a higher percentage of their income in energy, both in their homes and in transportation. So public transportation is a great way to offset that. So investments in public transportation make a heck of a lot of sense. Getting cars off the road and putting people in buses in good bus systems. Right now, the triangle is working through a light rail system. Man, I don't know if that will ever get built. I'm not really sure. I mean, it's such a political bailiwick. But man, buses are out there every day making these routes. And they can become a whole lot more efficient and a lot uh, less of a footprint um, if we develop them, first of all, from a design standpoint, more energy efficient uh, designs, more aerodynamic, lighter, stronger, using carbon fiber, things like that. Then you look at the drive train systems. You've got all the hybrid technology out there. But then you add biodiesel to it. Biodiesel, oh my god, then you know, if it's locally made, it's one of these you know, 100,000, couple hundred thousand, you know, million gallon plant within your community, the footprint is amazingly low. So we have uh, infrastructure already out there that could take this stuff, plug and play. So in our bus fleet, we have, um, we have about 10 buses, only about six of them are actually insured right now. But we have, throughout the fleet that we use, we have a tanker truck and a couple of um, smaller trucks that we use just to go utility trucks. We have a couple of TDIs. But in the, the variety of large engines that we work with, Cats, Cummins, Internationals, Detroits, all running B100 with little to no problems. The biggest issue has been filter changes, a couple few lines had to roll out. Um, but, uh, oh yeah, I, I forgot, the polar vortex. An anomaly that came down the road this year, or this, uh, this uh, spring, Oh my gosh, you know, we, uh, Piedmont and all of us in this area usually blend to about a B80 um, in the wintertime. It's pretty mild, you know, we get dips down in the 20s, but, you know, a couple of weeks maybe at ambient uh, around uh, 32 degrees. So B80 is usually plenty good. Um, so we had this polar vortex come whipping through, uh, and we were down in the single digits in the teens, and we had highs of 32. Um, and that was for many days. And so we had slushy cones in our buses. Um, and I had a full calendar of things to do with those buses. So you 
can imagine the nightmare that this was that proceeded during those days of trying to get those buses back filled with diesel and additive to get them down running down the road. I was literally riding this big bus down the road to the diesel pump. Um, this huge bus going five miles an hour with people honking behind me going, you know, what's wrong? I had a cop pull me over, like, what's wrong with your bus? Like, um, it's five diesel, long story, just trying to get down the street. Can you go with me here? You know, work with me. Um, so, uh, just crazy stuff. I mean, I, I literally had to park a couple of buses like halfway between the station and our site um, while I was doing this, you know, kind of shuffle, go get the diesel in five gallon uh, uh, buckets, uh, uh, jerry cans, bring it back to them. And, you know, I was like, oh, should I go all the way another two miles or should I just go down there and get the diesel in smaller uh, uh, amounts? So, yeah, what you got? Maybe you should have done two things. Just done like the uh, veggie oil guys. Yeah, those, uh, uh, Colin. Because my, my Toyota, what I was doing was uh, uh, tank one was diesel and biodiesel, depending on what the temperature is, depending on the mix. And tank two, you have five choices. You have diesel, biodiesel, uh, new and used vegetable, but I never used new vegetable, and uh, partially wrapped in biodiesel. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, one of the things we are interested in doing is taking maybe one of our local transits. Um, we have two interstate tour buses, and then the rest of our, what we have are really conventional uh, designed to go local, double door systems, no latrine. We we're thinking about taking one of our transits and setting up an SVO system on it. Um, just haven't gotten there yet. You know, it's one of those things that totally makes when sense. You do the SVO, you don't have to do the SVO, you have to get choices. Right, right. Yeah, and increase the, the options, and yeah. particularly with the idea of setting up any kind of heater system on, on the system. Oh, no, that's, no, that's all part of it. Yeah, yeah right, exactly. So it all. should weatherize us uh, for any kind of tips. Guys, uh, yeah, I don't know if those guys are in the room here, but the I brothers, was the brothers. So yeah, yeah. they seem to be the ones to talk to them, they'll say yeah. Yeah, and then just, you know, look at cost effectiveness and, uh, you know. Well, it's very cost effective. When I was doing the Toyota, yeah. a dollar a week, no matter what the distance was. Uh -huh. And most of the time I drove at least 100 points a day. Well, just, you know, the, the cost of the installation and you know, how, how yeah. effective it is, so. Um, no, because it's so far away. Yeah. It, it should. I mean, I, every look at SBO that I've seen, it seems to make sense and for a lot of these equipment. But we're, you know, we're pretty risk averse at this point. We're uh, trying to keep it simple. We've got a lot of variables. Um, it's not easy, you know, like just like our breakdown yesterday, you know, bringing the guys back. Wish that hadn't happened. I've been so much more positive about this. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of um, variables. These, uh, we don't like buying new equipment, um, particularly in, like new buses. First of all, they're really expensive. We like old stuff. Particularly the 90s era um, MCIs are just awesome tour buses. Very simple, don't have all the electronics. Um, but yet, you know, consumers want new, you know, they want new stuff. Um, but they're also, because they're old, they, you've got to constantly mine them. But anybody who works in biodiesel, and anybody who's working with trucks, or anybody's you know a tinker can do this, can, can work this business. So what we see is um, this capstone of the cycle, this this idea of um, transportation as being a very very viable way of generating income. In fact, anybody who's interested in going to biodiesel, I'd say start this business first, create your demand, and internalize that um, demand so that you have control over it and then start thinking of going backwards through the process. And uh, this is a cash flowing business pretty quickly, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, and so what we'd like to get to, and the point we're about that point right now, and unfortunately the banks are still not lending and it's very, very hard to get investors uh, who have the multiple variables of interest besides simply just rate of return um, to invest in what we're doing. But so far, from cash flow, we're able to do, we've been able to do a lot um, and kind of recover from the craziness that was trying to make fuel and sell it and compete against ExxonMobil to creating something that actually gives us a stage um, and allows us to talk to the community, integrate and talk with the community, engage the community. But this component is really, I think, um, a very viable thing that can be replicated. And so we're looking right now to actually merge with another, another company. Another guy's got like seven tour buses. Great, um, his company has a great reputation, great capital. Um, uh, his relationship with the bank is stellar, so I think I can actually get the money lended to us through his bank relationships to pay him off and then give us some additional capital to allow us to expand and to maybe go into another market. 
We don't necessarily want to go into another market that's very far away, but we want a market that is uh, consistent with what we've learned as a, as a real solid market. We don't like a lot of interstate travel. When you expose yourself to interstate, you're exposing yourself to a breakdown, say, way far away. And a tow bill from way far away for a big bus is really expensive. Mechanics bill, anything. What you want is that short local gig. And the universities, being in a university town is where it's at. Young people are very interested in bodies, very interested in transportation. They need transportation. And they're using you know, every Joe Blow out there. And man, wouldn't it be cool to be able to engage a bunch of young people and get excited about this stuff and put them in a body's bus. So that's where we think the, the opportunity exists. And so we're looking for people at this conference that may be interested in maybe partnering with us, um, you know, running, running the work in the ropes. Um, we don't necessarily want to own that business. We want to see it replicated and get out there. Because not only do you get to make some money and you know, move people around and have fun, um, party buses are pretty fun. I've kind of lost my interest. I've done about three years now. I'm like, I can, I, I can, I can do without that. You know, two, three o'clock in the morning, uh, pretty crazy. It's fun, but uh, you know, I'm kind of getting too old for that. Um, we've got other people that we have to drive for us. Okay, great, awesome, thanks. Yeah, so. Um, well, I wanted to talk a little bit about the strategy that we've got um, as far as the organization. So we are using a hybrid business model. We have the nonprofit, the Forest Foundation. Um, and when we have these LLCs, we have the Greenway Transit, Carolina Biodiesel. Um, we just split Carolina Biodiesel into two businesses, Carolina Biodiesel, which focuses on the distribution of fuel. We created another company called Green Oil Company, which just does the veggie oil collection. We did that for a number of reasons, but one, the credit. Because Carolina Bodies kind of went belly up, our credit looks not so great. So, you know, we've got this period where we lost money, and lost money, and lost money. Veggie oil collection and processing and sales actually was a money maker all day long, even though you have to pay for the, the oil. So we figure splitting that out makes it more of an interest, uh, an investment play for someone who's looking at our numbers. So we can separate the books out and, and show that, look at the numbers here, this is great, this is definitely a profitable business. So that and the Greenway Transit are two winners for us to go to, to, uh, to do capital. The nonprofit works as a overall um, organization and it, man it manages the site that we're in, pays the rent, uh, the other businesses pay rent to Ed, pays the lease on the property. It also manages our Green Jobs Training Program and a couple of other environmental education events. We have a booth at the State Fair here in North Carolina. We are out there in the trenches trying to educate folks. Um, and so having that nonprofit, and you can have actual control over it or you can be partnered with. But I really recommend that highly. Abundance and Peapunk is a smart model uh, where they've got a nonprofit working with a for profit. So um, it, it's a little challenging. Um, there's some issues with regards to perception. We have a nonprofit and for profits working together. You know, they're kind of going, well, why should I donate money to you when you've got these businesses? The nonprofit actually owns a percentage of each of these businesses, about 5% right now. So when they make money, it'll roll back to the nonprofit and help it do its work. But the businesses are also putting money through the nonprofit to help it uh, do its work by paying rent and, open, and utilities and things like that. So there's cash flow coming through the nonprofit that's helping it keep its structure, keeping the offices going, lights on. So you know, we have one person full-time employed with the nonprofit, and then we have a couple part-time people. The uh, Greenway Transit has about three full-time people. Um, mechanic, not there all the time, but I tell you what, that guy, without a good mechanic, a good bus mechanic, and there's a big difference between a mechanic and a bus mechanic. You've got to find a good bus mechanic. That's really critical. But he's there, you know, every couple of days he'll come by and uh, you know, do uh, this, this, that, and the other, uh, working on the buses. Um, we'll go out on a job, logbook, we just write in whatever's wrong with it, come back to the site, um, and have it worked on. But the, the biggest challenge for that uh, is the DOT inspections. You know, the Federal Motor Carriers Association is absolutely adamant about keeping good logs on information on the drug testing policy for drivers, all of that. So you have to have a dot the I across the T mentality with that business. Which you got. How old of a bus do you have to buy to get a good price range? That, that. Like, what's, that, the break, what's the break point? <laughs> that's a very valuable question. <laughs> I might have to uh, 
find, you know, ask you for a credit card for that one. Um, no, that's a really good question. We, we are seeing the, uh, the 90s here of um, uh, MCIs as being the best bang for buck. And there, you can get them from you know, around twenty to forty or fifty thousand dollars. So not but not too bad. We've actually found a bank that will loan on that era. You know, most banks won't loan on vehicles that old, but we found a company that specializes in bus lending. Pretty pretty nifty, and it's not a bad rate that they gave us for uh, those loans. Uh, so we uh, we used a loan. We already had to pay for a couple of our buses to pay for, but we went ahead and uh, got a, a loan on. Uh, vehicle to uh, just help capitalize us and it gives a little bit of a cushion of the bank account so we can have a little more flex. Um, so anyway, all right, so we think that this model is actually a really good one, uh, highly recommend it, but I'm going to run out of time so I think I'll go ahead and open up for questions. Uh, I, want to see those, I want to see your veggie bus. Oh, uh, yeah. Let me show you the, uh, the Greenway Transit's website. This, this, is, this is pretty cute. This is, this is our fleet. So book ride, our fleet, partner up. It's kind of what we, our, our tagline across gives you a little bit of a feel for what we're trying to do. But our fleet is what's pretty neat. So there's <laughs> five of us. That's the thing that we started out with. We finally acquired it um, from the guy that we originally were leasing it from. But it's a 1971 Mercedes Unimog model. And it uh, doesn't have AC. It uh, doesn't go very fast. It's really loud. Um, but man, is it cute. It turns on a dime. You can see out of every window and rear view mirror. Um, so it's great for driving, really easy, but it's definitely local. You know, you're not going very far in that. Uh, Gilly uh, Transit Bus, you see them all over the place. Um, Durham has hybrid versions of those right now. The bus below, this one here is a, a Bluebird, not a good bus. Highly not, definitely don't recommend Bluebirds um, in any form or fashion. Um, they are just not well made at all. Thomas's and yeah, school bus don't do it. Um, you're better off with the MCIs or the Gillies or um, we have some Orions, uh, which are also really, really well-built bus. We bought a bunch of buses from Duke that they were scrapping, unloading. Uh, Duke University was unloading like nine buses and we had to buy all of them. But we got them at basically scrap value and they all had maintenance records, which is really important uh, for finding you know, what needs to be done in the maintenance, the maintenance schedule. But uh, they had been treated and taken care of very, very well. So we got an incredibly good deal, and those things have been war courses. We have packed Duke students in those things and taken them to parties, I mean, like sardines. Um, and the great thing about transits is that you're allowed a certain amount of standing room. Um, it's not just the, city, the seating room. You can have people standing if you're not going very far. So you can pack people in those things and make a lot of money moving people short distances. So and then there's the pedicab. That's my favorite. That's the best. That's the most social thing we do. And it is indeed a biofuel vehicle. We figured it out 10 miles from burrito. So, <laughs> so. And we got a little shuttle bus. That's an E450 uh, Ford. All of these things are running uh, biodiesel. I wouldn't recommend a Ford. You know, not, the, not that shuttle bus. It's, they've got, it's so packed because it's an aftermarket, the van um, engine, to get to anything uh, from a maintenance standpoint. It's a total pain in the butt. But I tell you what, these big MCIs, and they are a dream for a mechanic. Anywhere. Everything is there, visible, easy to get to. Uh, the best vehicle to start up is, is just probably start with one of those or one of the Gillies um, transit buses. What do you think of the old-fashioned school buses? I, I'm not a real fan. They don't go very fast. Um, they ride rough. Um, you know, they, it just you know you can get one, and they're kind of cool. And you know, if you look at the history, you got like um, what is it? Further, the bus further. Anybody seen that documentary? It's the um, uh, the um, electric acid cooling test. Anybody read that book? Yeah, um, this group, uh, Ken Kesey, Kesey, a uh, great, great American writer, uh, part of the heat movement. He took a bus, a school bus, across America, and they actually documented it during the '60s. And they were all tripping on acid, and <laughs> it was, and they decorated this bus like. And then there's the Grateful Dead buses too, which are all old uh, uh, school buses. So as a part of the flavor of the, the idea of what we're, you know, we're trying to achieve, it's a lot of fun. They're, they're pretty cool. And you can decorate them and, and do stuff. They're fine for local transit, uh, very, very local. But I think that, you know, bang for buck, um, my mechanic sees a school bus and goes, and he's a bus mechanic, and he would much rather work on uh, some of these other guys. 
they're tough. You know, Detroit Diesel Series 50, Series 60. We're using, uh, we have a couple of 740 trannies in them, um, Allison trannies. They're the old style transmission, but they're tough as nails and they're cheap to replace if they break. The B500s, which came out in 96 in the MCIs, B500 trannies are really expensive to replace, but they're also pretty tough, they're good, good tranny. But I prefer the 740s all day long because if we have to drop a tranny, you know, it's a lot less, like maybe $5,000 versus $15,000. So, um, any questions? What you got? Um, can you say a little more about how you compete on price with, with, with non-biodiesel companies? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we don't try to wave the flag too hard. Um, you know, when people start giving a push, um, we try to bring in all the other stuff that we're doing. So we look at the value proposition, the, the wider value proposition. So it took us a while to figure out what is a good price point um, to offer. We, we had to find out what the competition was doing. We factor it by mile or by hour. Usually local gigs are by hour, and distance gigs, long distance gigs, by the mile. So somewhere between $350 and $4 uh, a mile for long distance is what we usually charge. And then some additional fee, the bus has to overnight, and the driver should get uh, paid for in, in the room for them, and a tip for the driver is usually the way we go. Local is like $120 an hour for the big buses, the big passenger buses are about $100 for the uh, party buses. And we've tricked out our buses, like the transit buses. Um, we put lights in them, we put really good stereos in them. We even toyed with the idea of like disco lighting and all of that, but we're going, man, that would be brutal on the poor driver. Not only do you have the beat of the music and people yelling in your ear and drunk in your face, which they're not supposed to go beyond the yellow line. Um, but we're well, he does. Yeah, no, no. Oh, so you know this. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's just, you know, poor drivers, man, they, you know, they're in the, the throw of things. It's quite a, a challenge um, to, to, to deal with them. So it all depends. You know, we have a lot of fudge factor. We have a contract that is bullet tight. I mean, it is, you know, we got everything listed in there. If you so much as glance the wrong way, you know, you're going to get hit with a fine or uh, additional costs. We tend to be pretty cool about it, and we are very reasonable. But when people give us, like this woman from Fuqua who was given a hard time about pricing, man, we just go back in the face and go, listen, you know, we are offering such a huge value proposition in what we do. Why are you sitting here fighting with us? You're going out to visit these organizations that are doing all the social entrepreneurship, these great groups, and you're sitting here fighting with us over the transportation, trying to keep it cheap. That's the story of life. I mean, that's the story of all of your life, I'm sure, as well. So, got a question? Yeah. Yeah, um, are you all um, interested in transporting products as in addition to... Doing rigs and uh, trailers? I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm talking about you getting to transporting local foods and stuff. Uh, well, we've had some talks about that. We had a local food distributor, an African-American, um, actually a farmer, who was looking to uh, borrow and lease one of our smaller trucks that we have and run it on bodies and move food around. So we had talked with him, um, you know, it's kind of leasing equipment to others it becomes a liability issue, you know, insurance-wise and all of that. So we prefer to sell stuff if we can, but most you know, small entrepreneurs can't really afford. So working some relationship out with people to make some of this equipment available that we have within our fleet uh, to help them grow their businesses is one of the components. You know, incubation of small green businesses is really where it's at. And we have right now on our site a really cool company called Food Forward that is actually going out to restaurants and collecting food scraps and he just got this really awesome garbage truck refurbed completely redone and you guys helped him did you guys help did you help him out okay yeah so uh this guy noah and it fits pretty well with our site except this garbage truck kind of stinks but anyway um we're right next to a lot of really stinky things we've got a track race company that actually moved into our old site and when they're moving track race it is the worst <laughs> absolutely the worst smell but um He's going to run biodiesel in his garbage truck, which is great. And we've got a pump on our site, and uh, he's going to he's renting space to park his truck. So there's all of this synergy that comes out of having that infrastructure for biodiesel and, and having like a small um, office and uh, places where people can share space. And uh, what comes out of it are these conversations and these ideas that I think are really where it's at when it comes to where we're moving in, into the future. So it's a good question, though. I mean, we're kind of interested, but. Um, you know, we've talked about rigs and running um, a, a trailer rig. We have a tanker trailer, a big old 7,300 gallon 
fourth compartment uh, tractor trailer. It's not really road um, certified yet, so we'd have to take it to DOT and have it completely checked out, all the lights, all the tires, all everything redone. We were just using it for storage. This is sitting on our site um, that we bought for dirt cheap. What you got? Okay, we're just done. Yeah, okay. So we're just Great. finishing up. So we're gonna do the tour now out at Piedmont. So I'd like to thank Mark for his